Good morning and good afternoon everyone and welcome to this AWS webinar series on expanding your data centre with hybrid infrastructure. My name is Richard Busby, I'm an ecosystem solution architect with Amazon Web Services based in Wellington, New Zealand and over the next 45 minutes or so we'll be taking you through an introductory level uh, topic uh, about expanding your data centre using AWS in conjunction with your data centre and the benefits that that brings. So let's start by asking a fairly simple question about what is hybrid IT? Gartner provide a really helpful definition here, which is that hybrid IT is the result of combining internal and external services from a combination of internal and public clouds in support of a business outcome. And these are really quite important terms if you think about it. Uh, you need to start thinking about your hybrid IT environment in terms of services that you're going to uh, consume from both internal and external and how you're going to use a combination of those services to deliver business outcomes. One of the things that we often find customers doing in their journey through hybrid cloud is evaluating the performance, functionality differences, etc. between public clouds and their own internal internal IT environments and assessing which of their workloads are going to be most suited to run in each environment. So why do we want to look at hybrid IT? Uh, the simple reason is that a lot of you have existing investments today in your own data centre and your on-premise solutions and you need to continue to be able to capitalise on those while also realising the benefits that the AWS cloud can, can give you. Some of those common benefits are things like scalability. It's much easier to scale on the AWS cloud than it is to do so in your own data center in many, many cases. Security. AWS works very, very hard to achieve and maintain a number of different security and industry compliance uh, certifications. And these are things that are of benefit to every single AWS customer out there. So we're really, uh, it makes it very easy for you to achieve those benefits in the AWS cloud for workloads that require certain compliance or security certifications. AWS is also a durable and highly available scenario, uh, uh, platform. So um, you can put applications on the AWS cloud and be assured that, for example, your data is going to be there for a long, long period of time. It's going to be very durably stored. And you can architect applications on the AWS cloud to be very, very highly available. Uh, AWS also gives you a lot of agility. We have a number of tools, some of which we'll talk about today and some of which we won't, uh, that enable you to rapidly deploy applications out to AWS, enable you to template those, deploy them multiple times, revision them, change them very, very easily. Another reason that we see people starting to look at the AWS cloud is global reach. So I have customers in New Zealand, for example, uh, one of those is a company called eRoad, and eRoad are a road user charging organisation. So they put uh, things in, in trucks and cabs around the world that uh, record where a user is travelling or where a truck's going, and they need to be able to do that all over the world and then report on that for customers all over the world. Doing that from a single physical facility located in somewhere like New Zealand or elsewhere in, in you know, Sydney or wherever is difficult. It's much, much easier for them to be able to go global by adopting or adapting to AWS, deploying their applications out across multiple physical facilities all across the world and getting very close to their customers. Another reason that people often look at AWS is the breadth of services. So we'll talk about some services today. Uh, we have around 45 different services now that cover a range of different use cases from real-time analysis to Internet of Things to raw compute power to storage to administration and deployment. And being able to consume those services quickly easily and as a pay, on a pay-as-you-go basis can often be a lot easier than trying to build the same kind of thing inside your own data centre. So to start with, with, let's talk about a number of common hybrid workloads that we see customers adopting when they're on their hybrid journey with AWS. The first of those is backup and archive. Uh, this is a, a very easy way to get started in a hybrid environment, hybrid cloud. 
um, using existing backup software that you may have in your environment, using existing archiving software that you have in your environment. And rather than continuing to store and retain that information, either on expensive disk storage in your own in your own uh, data center, or potentially dealing with the frustrations and hassles of things like tape off-siting, rather than doing that, simply leverage the AWS cloud for the long-term storage of your archival data, long-term storage of your backup sets, etc. Uh, leave the heavy lifting and management of that data long term to AWS, but with a really minimal change to the way you continue to run and operate your software. You can continue to use your existing software, you can continue to use your existing uh, processes and teams and technologies uh, and gain benefit very, very quickly. Another common use case is disaster recovery. We often see people who have a single site, they have everything in one site, uh, and they're looking at disaster recovery. Disaster recovery is, is often a very complex and expensive undertaking for many customers. You have to have a second site. It has to be geographically dispersed from your first site, for example. Uh, a lot of the time when you have that disaster recovery site, you've spent a lot of time and effort and money creating it and configuring it, only to find that most of the time you're not using it because you're not suffering from a disaster. By using AWS as a disaster recovery target, you only pay for what you use. The majority of the time you use very few or, or no resources in AWS that cost you any money. But you can have a templated, automatically deployable, fully featured disaster recovery site set up on AWS that can be up and going within minutes or hours after a major disaster event to provide you with a degree of business continuity. Another uh, very common use case is big data and analytics. So rather than replacing existing functionality as we did with backup and archiving, and moving things that you do today out to the cloud, Often people are looking at what new things can we do by leveraging the power of the AWS cloud. And big data and analytics is a really good example of that. Uh, setting up a big data environment, setting up a large business intelligence analytics environment or a data warehouse on premises can be quite an expensive upfront uh, investment for you. And it's often something that therefore is very, very difficult to, uh, to write a business case for or to get going with because it's risky if you spend a lot of money up front to try and do something like this and then you find that actually it hasn't delivered you the business value that you wanted, uh, you're now left with a lot of money, a lot of time and effort being spent and very little value being delivered. And overall, this is one of the key themes that we see time and again with customers adopting the AWS cloud is this flexibility and agility. The ability to experiment with something like big data or analytics and say, well, try that. We'll pay as we go, we'll use it, we'll see what value it delivers us. And if it delivers us no value, then at least we've failed fast. We've experimented with something, we've tried something out, and it didn't work. And it cost us a few hundred dollars, uh, but lesson learned, right? Let's go on and do something else instead. If it does deliver you business value, then people start looking at how do we do more with this stuff? How do we optimize our costs on AWS? so that we're spending less over time with AWS. It's something that, that the solution architects and the others within AWS are very passionate about is helping you as our customers save money and do the right thing on AWS. We also see in the similar vein to backup and archiving, storage expansion. So people looking at not necessarily archival or long, uh, you know, very old data, but simply running out of space in their existing uh, data centers. Rather than going through a CapEx process of spending a lot of money up front buying storage, buying storage arrays, things like that, having to guess at how fast your storage is growing and how much of that needs to be sitting on expensive tier one storage locally, look at AWS, uh, look at some of the hybrid services that we offer to migrate older data into AWS, have us manage it, have us make it available online for easy and instant retrieval. Uh, but with no uh, upfront costs, no long-term commitments, simply a pay-as-you-go. So as you use more data, you pay for the data that you're using. As you use less data, you pay less charges. Uh, another common theme on that similar kind of elastic vein is dev, test, and proof of concept environments. So you may well have internal test environments, internal development environments, 
whether you're doing your own bespoke software development or whether you're simply using uh, off-the-shelf software and you need to, uh, to test new versions, point patches, upgrades, service packs, things like that. One of the very common, kind of almost a standing joke amongst a lot of customers is, is talking to them about what is your development environment look like, what is your test environment look like, and how close is that as a replica of your production environment. And it's very rare indeed that someone has a test environment that's a really representative copy of what's going on in production. So by using the power of the AWS cloud, you can recreate environments that are very, very similar to your production environment. You can create them very fast, you can create multiple copies of them, you can run them for as long as you need, and when you've finished proving whatever it is you need to prove, a service pack or a proof of concept or something, you can simply shut that entire environment down and stop paying for it. And then lastly, we also see people moving business critical applications into AWS. So as uh, your level of confidence and your maturity with Amazon Web Services uh, increases, people start looking at AWS as the de facto place to start running applications now, rather than running things in our own data center and pushing it out to AWS, starting to think about it in terms of the other way around. Let's start pushing things out to AWS unless there's a really good reason that we have to run it inside our own organization. So those are some of the use cases, some of the common hybrid workloads that we start to see when people adopt a, a hybrid cloud. Um, let's talk a little bit about the AWS services and the building blocks that enable you as someone who's fairly new to AWS to get started with this. So this is uh, effectively the way AWS groups and thinks about our services, and this can be quite an overwhelming thing to look at initially. It's a very, very complex, busy kind of slide. So what we'll focus on right now, down the bottom here, are the infrastructure services. So these in blue at the bottom are some of the core services that customers use. Uh, some of the core services that they consume very frequently. We'll talk in a, in a moment about things like regions and availability zones, our geographic global physical footprint. Um, and then also some of the infrastructure services that people use when they're creating a hybrid cloud. So compute, the ability to get virtual machines, EC2 instances, we call them on demand. Uh, the ability to access object-based storage or file-based storage or block-based storage. The ability to grab uh, a SQL type database or a NoSQL type database from us on demand, networking, the ability to create your own network setups and so on. Sitting above that, very importantly, are security and management capabilities, so monitoring, identity and access management, access control, configuration management, encryption key management, things like that. The green vertical tower of management tools, so things like email tools, orchestration tools, notification tools, etc. And then there are a whole lot of other uh, capabilities here, so a set of platform services, specifically if you're doing things like custom development on AWS, a set of enterprise applications for things like virtual desktops on demand, sharing and collaboration email and calendaring systems. Uh, the set of hybrid cloud management systems over here on the right, so these are specific tools that we'll talk about today. Direct Connect, so the ability to form dedicated least line connections between you and the AWS cloud. Identity federation, deployment management, backup management, etc. So well, let's dive into some of these. Going back to the, the blue line that was down at the bottom and the AWS global infrastructure. So AWS is designed, uh, do, I beg your pardon. AWS is, uh, is in present in 11 regions around the world. Um, you can see these here. The closest region to most of us in the ANZ area is the Asia Pacific Sydney region down the bottom right hand corner. Uh, we also offer Beijing, Tokyo and Singapore in Asia Pac and then a number of regions across uh, Europe, North and South America as well. So that's 11 regions. You can choose where you want to run your workloads, where you want to store your data. And AWS will not move that data or those workloads to other regions unless you specifically tell us to. So if you're gonna put things in Sydney, if you're gonna run computing services or store storage in Sydney, for example, we will never move stuff outside of that Sydney region. 
Now inside each of these 11 regions, we have what we call availability zones. An availability zone you can think of as a data center, right? Under the hood, it's one or more physical facilities. We might actually have an availability zone that's comprised of multiple physical facilities. And if you look at the Sydney region here, we have two availability zones. So when you're designing or deploying solutions on the AWS cloud, you need to make sure that you are using multiple availability zones inside a region for redundancy and high availability. Each of our availability zones is on separate control planes, separate flood planes, electricity grids, telco connections, etc. So that if we have a large event that impacts availability of, a, of an availability zone, other availability zones in the same region will continue to run and should be unaffected. And that means that as you design your applications, as you migrate your applications across into the AWS cloud, use multiple availability zones and this becomes a high availability and disaster recovery mechanism for you. We also have 53 edge locations around the world. Edge locations are for our content distribution network, uh, a service called CloudFront, and also Route 53, our global DNS service. And lastly, we're going through a process of continuous expansion. Um, AWS is always looking to uh, where we should launch future regions, future edge locations uh, to best serve our customers. Uh, about six weeks ago, we announced that in 2016, for example, we will be launching a region in India to serve uh, our customers there. So let's talk about how that relates to our hybrid focus and how we go about creating a hybrid infrastructure. Uh, today you have your data centers, your physical facilities, they may be things that you own and control yourself, they may be things that where you're in a colo environment or a, an outsourced environment, etc. And on the other side here we have the Amazon Web Services Cloud with some, some apps in it. Um, and there are essentially four separate things that you need to look at when you're creating a hybrid environment. The first is, is connectivity, specifically private connections. You can put storage in AWS, you can run virtual machines in AWS and use our other services, and you can simply have those publicly accessible over the internet if you want to. In many cases, for many customers, they absolutely do want to do that. But in a hybrid scenario, often you will not want to have things that are publicly accessible. You will want to control and tightly manage the access, and having a private connection between your data center and the AWS cloud becomes of paramount importance. Once we've got that connectivity in place, then we look at workload migrations. So how do we get our existing virtual machines, physical machines, etc., data, content, migrated into the AWS cloud from our on-premise data centers? And then how do we also migrate it back if we need to? Part of the, the next step is access control integration. So pretty soon people are going to be asking, okay, great, we've got now a hybrid cloud, we can move workloads between them. How do we control who can do what in the AWS cloud? And how do we seamlessly manage and monitor that through single panes of glass? So we'll talk about that as well. And then also, how does your ops team and your performance teams and your management teams work with your existing management tools to manage both your, your on-premise data centers and the AWS cloud through a single common cohesive set of tools without having to throw out and recreate a whole bunch of tools? So let's talk a little bit about uh, virtual private cloud and what this is. So virtual private cloud is uh, a way of extending your data center and carving out a private network portion of your cloud for your use. So the way this looks is you can create your own, like I say, isolated section of the AWS cloud. You can bring your own IP. IP address space to this. Now this, the example here we've got is a 10.x private IP range. It can be private IP ranges. If you own a block of real world public IPs, for example, you can use your own real world public IP range as well. Typically this is going to be um, a subset or a disjoint set from your existing internal IPs because you want to create routing between your own private uh, cloud, virtual private cloud here on AWS and your data center back at base. Uh, you could also create another virtual private cloud, for example, with exactly the same networking. So that's a great use case if you have um, an application where you need a test environment 
you have to have the same IP address range as your production systems, for example, because things are hard coded. You could stand up an isolated virtual private cloud with exactly the same network range that you have internally uh, in your own data centers if you had to. So once we've created the virtual private cloud, we've assigned an address range to it. Uh, we then, that virtual private cloud is mapped across multiple of these availability zones. Typically it's mapped across all of the availability zones in a region. And inside the virtual private cloud, we can now create all of the usual networking constructs that you'd see um, in your own environment. So subnets, um, IP addressing restrictions, routing tables, gateways between things. So here I can create two separate subnets. I can have my own um, uh, subnet ranges, subnet masks for those subnets, etc. And I can create routing tables that define how I route between those individual subnets inside that virtual private cloud. I can also create things like VPN connections and external internet gateways. So a VPN connection, I can then, that's a highly available managed VPN connection by AWS. The internet gateway again is a highly scalable, highly managed connection out to the public internet from here. I can have one of those, I can have both of those, I can have neither of those. And your choice of, of which ones of these things or connectivity methods you'll use from your virtual private cloud really depends on your use cases. If you have systems that need to, um, uh, sorry, if you have systems that need to get out to the internet, then you'll have an internet gateway out the top there, um, allowing those systems to get straight out to the internet. You may well decide that actually, uh, because this is a hybrid environment, because this is really only for internal use, none of the systems that involve in that virtual private cloud need to get out to the internet themselves. They will all go back down through your VPN connection back into your existing data center. And a common use case for that is that you can then apply traffic filtering, logging, proxy servering, uh, WAF, any of that kind of stuff that exists today in your own data center. Have the, the virtual machines that are running in AWS all go through, back down through the VPN connection and out through your existing systems. Right. You choose where to deploy your workloads, so you can have um, an EC2 instance, an application server, database server, whatever you like, and you get to choose which of the subnets it's running in, and therefore what things like its routing tables look like. Um, we can also protect things at the subnet level using network access control lists or NACLs. So we can have that EC2 application server sitting there. It is or is not able to talk out to the internet. It might or might not be able to talk to things that are sitting in availability zone B in the pink subnet there. Right? So we can be quite explicit using these network access control lists on a per subnet basis how things can talk. We can also use uh, what's called a, per, a, a security group. A security group is a per instance firewall, and that allows us to wrap a security group, a set of network firewall rules around things on a per instance basis. So even if I have multiple of these EC2 application servers sitting in the same subnet, I can set up security group rules such that they are isolated from each other. And this is a tremendously powerful set of capabilities. If you think about it, you can now micro-segment your, your network and your security design down to a per virtual machine layer and ensure that if, say, one of your machines is compromised or uh, you know, fails some kind of integrity check, that it's not able to talk to any other instances, even those on the same subnets, unless you specifically said so with security group rules. So another thing that, uh, that, that people start to look at then is great, I've created my virtual private cloud, uh, I've created my networking setup inside AWS, that's fantastic, but how do I connect that back to my corporate network, back to my existing data center? So there's two main methods of doing this. The first is to use uh, a VPN service. So AWS provides a VPN service. It's a highly available, redundant set of hardware VPN concentrators in each of the AWS regions that you want to connect. And that will then form a set of, of IPsec VPN tunnels back to your existing hardware, your router, your firewall on your premises. Right? Uh, if you have multiple routers uh, on your premises, then we can form up to four highly available redundant tunnels with path failover between them. And that's typically how most people get started, a VPN connection. It's a pay-as-you-go, there's no long-term commitments, uh, you're simply paying for as long as you have the VPN connection up and running. What people often find then is that they start using more and more of AWS and they start to potentially hit the limits of VPN in terms of throughput. 
or they want to lower their costs. And so we offer a second option here, which is called AWS Direct Connect. Direct Connect is effectively a leased line between your premises and AWS. So this is something where you will work with AWS and your telco or ISP. Uh, we will provision up a customer router, so that can be on your premises. Uh, it will use leased line into AWS, into peering points that we have around the world, and from there the traffic will go over a private link to us. So rather than being uh, VPN encrypted over the public internet, now you have a dedicated leased line between AWS and your corporate network. So the example we've got here, uh, let's say we were using this in Sydney, we peer at two places in Sydney. We peer at Equinix SY2 and Global Switch in Sydney. Uh, so you could create peering points with your ISP from your data centers to those points in Sydney where AWS also peers and now have um, a very, very fast, very low latency and cheaper uh, dedicated connection into the AWS cloud and that then can be routed straight into your virtual private cloud here. So we can go from 50 megabit connections up to 10 gigabit connections. Uh, you can choose the connection speed you want and that's really a discussion between yourself and the, uh, the, the ISP or telco provider as to what speeds you want. Um, in the example here we have a single virtual private cloud at the top of the diagram. You can connect a single direct connect connection up into multiple virtual private clouds. So you might decide that you want to have multiple virtual private clouds because you want to have uh, say uh, mission critical workloads running in one, test and development workloads running in another, you want that network level segregation, you can have multiple virtual private clouds and then have a single direct connect connection talking to and communicating with all of those different virtual private clouds. Um, we do this using standard VLANs and layer 3 routing protocols such as BGP um, and that then enables you to uh, to have a dedicated, like I say, high-speed connection between the corporate network and the AWS cloud. You can also deploy your own network equipment into that AWS, uh, into that direct connect peering location. So you might decide that actually you're going to use some WAN optimization devices uh, and or firewalls or other um, network hardware, and you can put those into the Equinix or Global Switch data centers in Sydney where we're peering. And you can then, for example, tr uh, terminate all of your WAN acceleration traffic on those devices over the Direct Connect connection, then from there send them into AWS. So that gives us uh, now a, a set of network uh, topologies. We've got an arbitrary set of network topologies sitting in, in the virtual private clouds in AWS. Um, we've got our own uh, security groups, network access control lists. If you want to do things like bring your own firewall, virtual machines and appliances and things, you can run those in AWS as well. And we've also got virtual private network and dedicated direct connect links now between AWS and your own data center. So the next question is how do we go about actually moving workloads into AWS? Um, we have a VM import export service and this uh, integrates into um, things like vCenter uh, and the Hyper-V Management Console and this allows us to import virtual machines from things like VMware's ESX, Microsoft Hyper-V and Citrix Zen. So I can take a running virtual machine that runs on your premises today, we will end up taking a snapshot of that virtual machine, migrating that snapshot or copying that snapshot into AWS. US, and then standing that up as a virtual machine or an EC2 instance in the AWS cloud. Once they're in there, you can export them again as well. So via the command line, we have a, a series of, of AWS command lines. One of the specific commands is this thing called uh, EC2 create instance export task. And this will create a task to take a running uh, virtual machine in the AWS cloud, an EC2 instance, and export a copy of that back out so that you can then bring that back to base, back to your on-premise location if you need to. Now, in terms of, of identity and access management and how we go about controlling and accessing and managing all of this, uh, the resources in AWS, so identity and access management is our service that does this. This is a, a controlled, um, very granular, like role-based access control. So I can create multiple users in my identity and access management service in AWS. Those users are members of 
groups, the groups have sets of permissions applied to them, and the permissions control what a user can or cannot do inside an AWS account. Um, so I might have, for example, um, a user who is res uh, responsible for monitoring, and they have read access to CloudWatch, our monitoring service, but they might not have access to do anything with EC2, the compute service, or S3, the storage service. So they can see events that are happening, but they can't actually go and change anything. Well, they may have read-only access to EC2. They can go and find out which virtual machines are running. They might have access to S3, a simple storage service. They can see what objects are being stored in AWS, but they can't do anything to those objects. So we can be very granular about the permissions that an individual user or a group of users has. We also have access to things like multi-factor authentication. Um, so rather than just requiring a username or password, we require a username, a password, and then a two-factor authentication token code for people to be able to do things on, on AWS. And that we can also restrict. So most operations, for example, like going and viewing a set of logs or performance metrics, I might not need multi-factor authentication to, that, to do that terminating an EC2 instance, so killing off a virtual machine, or removing things from an S3 bucket. Uh, you know, anything that involves data deletion, I might set up multi-factor authentication on those specific actions, so that if a user's doing something destructive, they're going to have to enter a multi-factor authentication token first. We also have a service called CloudTrail. CloudTrail is an API logging service. So whether you're doing things through the console, to the web console in AWS, whether you're doing things through command line, or whether you're interacting with AWS through our SDKs, such as, say, the Python or the .NET or the Ruby SDK. Ultimately, what you're doing in every case is making an API call to a set of AWS services. And that might be, say, run instances. Go and create and run a virtual machine for me, please. Those API calls are then logged using a server is called CloudTrail, and the logs are then copied into a storage location in AWS that you can access. So this means that you can now grab those logs, look through them, and see what every single user has done, every single API call they've made to try and change anything in AWS, who made it, what time they made it, uh, what they actually requested the IP address they came from, whether it was a success or a failure returned. Right? So we get a full audit take capability through CloudTrail. And lastly, we can federate with your on-premise Active Directory or other directory as well. So this becomes really important uh, in a hybrid scenario where you already have users that exist today in your existing Active Directory um, or, or other um, LDAP-style directory. Uh, so we provide a single sign-on endpoint to manage this. This means that users can go to a web console, uh, say mycompany.aws.amazon.com, and they can sign in using the same username and password that they sign in to the uh, to Active Directory with. We will work with your existing Active Directory, so we use um, things like the, uh, the Active Directory ADFS, Directory Federation Services, to, to create this trust between AWS and your directory services. We can then go and authenticate that user for you, verify that they are who they say they are, and allow them then to log into the AWS console. Um, we do this by things like matching groups, so you specify which group you want to to use as the, if you like, the primary group for determining permissions, add those users or keep those users in existing groups inside Active Directory, and then we will check and see if that user is a member of a group with that name. If they are a member of a group with that group name, that will determine the permissions that the user has to do things in AWS when they've logged in. So it becomes very easy to manage bulk users, existing users, uh, by federating them with Active Directory and AWS. We also have a number of other plugins uh, for third-party vendors that enable you to do this. So things like Ping Identity, Okta, um, My One Login, etc., Simplified, Salesforce, Exedium, and others. And this allows um, multiple different methods like that to handle single sign-on. So if you're not an Active Directory user, or if you're using one of these other technologies for managing your single sign-on today, Extending that out to manage single sign-on and identity federation into the AWS cloud is very, very easy. We also work with your existing management tools as well. This becomes really, really important for people that have a lot of time and effort and energy invested in existing tool sets because you don't want to have to change anything about your tools or your operational processes to adopt 
to AWS and start with benefits of the AWS cloud. So here's an example of the AWS management portal for vCenter. This allows us to see the Amazon Web Services logo up the top, the different regions in the left hand side navigation pane here, and then the different uh, EC2 instances, so what we call an AMI, an Amazon machine image. This is equivalent of a VMware vCenter template for example. So I can create multiple AMIs and then I can start, run or stop multiple EC2 instances that are deployed copies, running copies of what's contained in that AMI. When we talked about the AWS VM import export service, when I import a machine I can have have it imported and it's, it'll show up in the management center here as an AMI. I can then create one or more instances of that AMI very easily. The language that we use in the management portal for vCenter is very familiar to VMware vSphere admins. So this means that your administrative team don't have to use new tools, they don't have to uh, you know, learn new technologies or phrases or idioms or anything like that to be able to get started with the AWS cloud. They can use a familiar set of technologies with a familiar set of terminologies and phrases and get started very easily. Um, it is a self-service portal, it's located within the VMware vSphere client. You can see here it's, uh, it's located within the, uh, the C-sharp vSphere client. Um, we are looking also at deploying this within the new vSphere uh, web UI as well. Uh, we can migrate virtual machines, as we said, from vSphere to AWS. Uh, we can also use that command line tool to migrate them from AWS back into vSphere if you want to. As well as migrating your existing virtual machines, you can also deploy new workloads into AWS. So we talked a moment ago about the AMIs, the Amazon machine images, the templates for these systems. Um, AWS and third parties provide canned AMIs already that you can use to stand up brand new virtual machines. So you can do that from within the, uh, the management console as well. Right. Makes it very, very easy for your vSphere admin team to get used to the idea of working with AWS. Similarly, uh, AWS has a SCOM pack, so we can um, we can plug into Microsoft System Center Operations Manager or SCOM, and this allows us to get a whole load of metrics and performance tools, uh, performance information that comes from CloudWatch. CloudWatch is our metrics and monitoring service, and that allows us to then grab performance metrics for your EC2 instances storage buckets, etc. See how those machines are performing, set alarms and alerts, etc. on here. We can also use um, uh, SCOM to do dependency mapping. So, for example, if I have a, a, an EC2 instance, a virtual machine running, it might have some block store volumes associated with it, so, you know, places where I'm storing, say, databases or other long-term important information. And because we understand the dependencies between a running virtual machine and the storage on which it sits, we can provide that relationship mapping as part of the SCOM pack adapter. That means you can get kind of entity relationship diagrams and things like that inside SCOM fairly easily. We also support uh, a management pack for System Center Virtual Machine Manager. So if you're using SCVMM, this plugs in at the top here as an Amazon EC2 tab. And similarly, I can see the individual AWS EC2 instances uh, that are running in the AWS cloud. I can see the status of them. I can do things like starting, stopping, terminating, cloning virtual machines or EC2 instances from within the virtual machine manager. Right? I can view the stuff by region, by availability zone, etc. I can also import machines again from my on-premise Hyper-V hosts into AWS and then again use that command line tool to be able to export back out. So in summary, uh, why should you start thinking about hybrid IT and start doing things in a, in a hybrid cloud manner? Right? Uh, the really important thing is that AWS provides a whole bunch of capabilities that you can use that are difficult or time consuming or expensive to do on your own, in your own facilities. Right? So you can start using the capabilities of AWS to solve problems for your business. You can start experimenting with new features like big data analytics for example. You can start migrating existing machines out uh, or copies of existing machines out for test and development environments that are short term, short lived. Stand the thing up, run it for a week, uh, test do what you need to do, 
and then shut it down and stop paying for it. So there's a whole lot of speed, agility, service richness, etc., that's available in AWS. Like I say, it can be very difficult or time consuming to do a lot of the stuff internally in your own data center. So the, back to the summary, there are four main things that you need to look at as you begin this journey. The first is private connections through VPN or direct connect links. So setting up your networks inside VPC, the virtual private cloud in AWS, connecting that back to your data center. Using plugins or things like uh, VMware or System Center to be able to exist, uh, move your existing workloads into and out of AWS quickly and easily. Uh, integrating our identity and access management service to uh, your existing identity services like Active Directory or Ping or whatever to give yourself single sign-on and a single way of managing and controlling access information. And then working with your existing performance tools, so SCOM, uh, VMware vRealize operations, Nagios, there are plugins for many, many performance tools out there that will take performance and metrics data from AWS and aggregate that in so you can continue to use your existing performance management, operations management monitoring tools. Coming up next week, we've got a series of 200 level um, lunch and learn events across Australia and New Zealand. So you can see the dates and times here for the individual events. Um, these, this will take uh, a lot of the content that we've discussed today, but discuss it at a much more deeper level. So uh, demos and discussing the practicalities of exactly how to get started with this stuff. So if you're looking at this and thinking this is great, I need to know more, where do I go next? The answer is come and have a look at our lunch and learn sessions running next week across Australia and New Zealand. We've also got the AWS Innovate Virtual Conference happening on the 2nd of September. Um, you can see the registration bar down the bottom here, so aws.amazon.com slash events slash AWS Innovate AU. And this is a set of, of technical sessions right from beginner level all the way through to absolutely expert level, um, covering a number of different AWS services, technologies, approaches, integrations, etc. We'll have a keynote at the beginning talking about AWS and our customers and some of the awesome things our customers have done on the AWS cloud. Uh, there's the opportunity for you to network with our sponsors as well in the Solutions Pavilion and discuss how some of the third party systems out there can also help you get started with AWS more quickly. And we'll also be hosting a live Q&A during the event. Finally, we have a set of on-demand resources that are out there for you. Um, we have a series of videos that are available. Uh, the AWS YouTube channel is a very, very rich source of information for all things AWS, again, right from beginner, introductory level, all the way through to very deep technical. We also have a series of hands-on self-paced labs that you can go through to get real practical hands-on experience with AWS services in a guided, time-framed manner. Very, very good way to get started. We offer instructor-led courses, so these are one-day and three-day instructor-led technical training on things like architecting on AWS, so how to architect your applications on AWS for cost efficiency, for high availability, for elasticity, for fault tolerance, etc. Uh, systems operations on AWS. So how do things change for a systems operator on AWS? How do they do things differently? Developing on AWS, so if we're going to use some of the, the more developer-oriented services, how do we take advantage of those? And lastly, certification. We offer a series of certifications that help individuals prove their expertise on the AWS platform. Thanks very much for taking the time to listen to this webinar. I hope it's been useful. Like I say, a look at the lunch and learn events happening across Australia and New Zealand over the next week for further more detailed information. And if you have any questions, please use the chat window to ask. Thanks very much.